Hello, I'm Alec Bath, Applications Manager with SC's Wireless Microcontroller Products in the Americas. Today I'm going to introduce you to a great new product from our friends over at the Things Industries. It's the Generic Node SE, or Sensor Edition, small form factor, LoRaWAN end node, powered by the dual core STM32WL, the world's first truly monolithic sub gigahertz radio SOC, supporting LoRa modulation as well as FSK and BPSK type modulations. The Generic Note SE has a nice variety of typical sensors that your IoT EndNode may require. Humidity and temperature, ST's LIS 2DW12 low power 3-axis accelerometer, secure element, 16 megabit serial flash for data logging, RGB LED, buzzer and push button, as well as some expansion connectors for adding your own I2C-based sensors, UART, ADC inputs, and more. And with an onboard chip antenna, AA battery power option, all sealed up in a weather-tight enclosure. It's a fantastic solution for data logging and remote sensor monitoring with the long-range low-power capabilities of LoRaWAN and the STM32WL. Now, while we don't have native support for this board in our stm 32 cubewl firmware library, Today I'm going to walk you through some of the steps to create a LoRaWAN EndNode project for this board with a little help from our suite of Q-based ecosystem tools. STM32 Cube IDE for compilation, programming, and debug, which is a GCC-based integrated development environment. STM32 Cube Programmer for flash and register operations. The STM32 Cube WL firmware library packed with lots of great application examples. And with a little help from our ST-Link V3 debugger or V3 mini debugger and a few flying wires, deploy your generic node sensor data onto the Things Industries LoRaWAN network. Enjoy. Now let's review those hardware and software bits we'll need to get started. Of course, our generic node SE and two AA batteries, or you can easily wire in a 3 volt power supply for test and debug, a USB micro B cable, an ST Link V3 set, or even another STM32 Nucleo board can be easily wired in as a debugger. Seven or eight flying jumper wires, male on our generic node end and female on our de debugger end. STM32 Cube IDE, or alternatively the IAR or Kyle development environments will work just fine. The STM32 Cube WL firmware library, and finally a terminal emulator such as TerraTerm. There are also a number of free optional Cube ecosystem tools, which we won't use today, but are highly useful and I would recommend downloading as well. CubeMX, our step-by-step -step graphical configuration tool for GPIO pins, clock setup, peripheral and middleware initialization, and more. Cube Programmer for standard flash, erase, and erite functions and non-volatile register data access, which as an alternative to TerraTerm can be used to retrieve our device EUI. Cube Monitor, our Node-RED flow-based tool for real-time variable debug and can also be used with the STM32WL for RF testing. And finally, Cube Monitor Power, which in conjunction with the X-Nucleo LPM01A Power Shield Board, can be used to measure real-time current measurement, very useful for low power use cases such as the generic node. All of these great tools are easily found via the search bar at st.com. You'll also want to register your my.st.com account to stay up to date on tools and firmware updates, which you'll be prompted for. With ST's Cube Tool ecosystem, you have a powerful, free, iterative design cycle of continuous improvement for your next wireless creation. Here are a few key hardware differences between our Nucleo WL55 
JC1 Evaluation Board, and the Generic Node. GPIOs to manage the TX and RX RF paths are mapped differently. Our Nucleo board has three switches and the generic node just one. Our three LEDs are also mapped differently. But our serial port remains the same. Use R2 on PA2 and PA3 pins on both boards. Now let's take a look at our flying wire debug connections between our ST-Link V3 set and our generic node board. The expansion board that comes with the ST-Link V3 set will need to be snapped onto the baseboard as we'll access CN6 and CN3 connections as shown on the left. Although your color code may be different, this shows the basic connection and the generic node on the right. As mentioned, it's also possible to use another nuclear board such as our Nucleo WB55 board shown on the right to act as our debugger. Here we're also powering the generic node from that Nucleo board. Although out of scope of today's video, if you need a LoRaWAN gateway to connect to the ThingStack V3, my colleague Joe Tiarina has an excellent video on the topic available on the ST Microelectronics YouTube channel, part two of his LoRaWAN with STM32WL Getting Started series. Shown below is the direct URL to the video as well. This uses our P-Nucleo LRWAN2 gateway, which is around $100 through distribution. While it's possible to use CubeMX to configure custom hardware from scratch to create a LoRaWAN end node, for today's video, we're going to take a simpler path. Modifying the existing single core end node project for our Nucleo WL55 JC1 board, as found in our Cube WL firmware library, and porting that to the generic node, which is not too difficult. Stay tuned in later in 2022, though, on our ST YouTube channel for some step by step guides to create STM32 WL based LoRaWAN end nodes based on your custom hardware. Of course, another thing you'll want to do is head over to genericnode.com, click on documentation, click on GitHub, and download the package zip file. There's lots of great documentation and Arduino style pinout diagram, great for framing on your lab wall, KiCad PCB source and Gerber files, 3D CAD step files, bill of materials, PDF schematics, which I would highly recommend printing out as they make a good reference while porting code. Of particular interest is the aptly named Buzzer Jumper JP2 on page 4, Buzzkill. There's a nice software architecture graphic, and of course, all of the source code for TTI's firmware deliverable, much of which is based on ST's CubeWL APIs. Well done, TTI. Now at this point, you should have acquired your generic node and ST-Link debugger hardware, wired in your ST-Link debugger, unzipped the CubeWL firmware library into a working folder of your choice, downloaded and installed STM32 Cube IDE, TerraTerm, and any of the other optional software tools detailed, downloaded the generic node GitHub repository zip file, and now we can get started with the code port. As a first step, if you've installed the STM32 Cube Programmer, you could quickly verify hardware and debugger functionality by launching the tool and connecting. Another interesting thing to do is to examine register location 1FFF7580, the eight bytes located are your device EUI. Note that the bytes are in little endian format. That is, the most significant byte is at the highest address. The example shown here has the first 24 bits as the organizational unique identifier registered with the IEEE for ST 0080E1. The next byte denotes the WL family, and the next four bytes will be a unique ID number, and yours should be different. 
Take note of your device EUI value as you'll be referencing it later. Now let's navigate to your unzipped version of the stm 32 QWL firmware library. It should be version 1.1.0. If we go to the projects folder, Nucleo WL55JC, Applications, LoRaWAN, LoRaWAN EndNode, and then the stm 32 cube IDE folder. Double click on the dot project and this should launch cube IDE. Now select or create a folder for your cube IDE workspace preferences, which can be separate from your project. Once launched, Close the Information Center page, and after a few seconds, your Project Explorer for your EndNode project sh should appear. Click the hammer icon to build the project. No errors. Now let's expand the Includes folder. LoRaWAN EndNode, LoRaWAN App folder structure. And double click on the LoRaWAN underscore app.h file. Here we'll have to change our region for me in the US to US 915. Your region may vary. Next, let's go to the drivers folder under Nucleo, nucleoradio.c, expand that. Click on the radio.c file, and then on the right, click on the radio.h file. It'll launch that header file. These are the three RF switch control GPIOs that need to be remapped according to our previous slide. One thing to note, this header file is read only. So if we go to the nucleo radio.c file, right click, show in system explorer, we can select nucleo.c.h, nucleoradio.c.h, right click on their properties, remove the read only attribute, apply, and OK. Now we can go in and make the necessary changes to the GPIOs. You may have noticed I've commented out the original text, so I can quickly change it back if I need to. And I add a tag so I can find my changes quickly. Double check your work that you've changed the pin, the port, and the clock enable and disable. Now if we click on the nucleo.c file and on the right outline the nucleo.h header file Scroll down and we'll find our LEDs that we also need to change. Because the port remains on GPIO B for the LEDs, the changes are quite simple. Only the pin defines for LED 1, 2, and 3. Just one last change in the nucleo.h file. We're going to remove the button functionality and just use a timer to send periodic messages. So make the define button end zero. One more change to make so our debugger doesn't crash is to disable low power mode while debugging. And that's in the sysconf.h file. So 
if we come over here double click on that expand that out we'll set debugger enabled to one and low power disable equal to one save rebuild now we'll get our debugger set up we'll go up to the debug configurations expand the STM32 Cortex-M application new configuration debugger we'll use the ST-Link GDB server in serial wire debug mode we can scan for our debugger there it is apply in the main in, in the new configuration main tab also browse for your LoRaWAN EndNode project Hit apply debug Now we can launch the debugger. We'll switch to our debug perspective when prompted. Click on resume or F8 and launch our application. Now let's talk a bit about LoRaWAN network commissioning parameters. Let's go into the applications LoRaWAN, LoRaWAN EndNode, LoRaWAN app, include folder path, and open the se-identity.h file. This has some of the typical commissioning parameters you're probably familiar with. Now previously when we looked at our derived device UI from QProgrammer, um, that is used if this pound define static device UI is set to zero. If you set this to one, you can put in a de device UI of your choosing here. But we're going to ignore this value and just use the derived value. For the LoRaWAN join EUI, this is equivalent to the app EUI in LoRaWAN 1.0. So in your portal, you would put the join EUI value in the app EUI activation information here. Here's our device EUI. And our last piece is the network key or app key. Here I've, I've set them, I've used the default value and modified them just slightly. They're the same values for LoRaWAN 1.0. We're actually only using the network key value. But um, in the portal, it'll say app key and you'll put that value here. Once you do that, We can watch our device. We can see our device UI, app UI, key. And in short order, we should get a join. There we go. Now let's talk a bit more about getting that TerraTerm terminal emulator set up. First thing we'll want to do is open a new connection and search for the ST-Link virtual COM port. Then if we go to the serial port setup, we'll want to use 115-200 BPS baud rate, 8 bits of data, no parity, and one stop bit, and no flow control. Here's another look at how you can use that TerraTerm commissioning information that comes up at reset to plug into your Things Network activation information page for your EndNode. Make sure those match up. 
Now at this point, you should have all the bits to get your generic node sensor edition connected, programmed, commissioned, and sending data. Every 10 seconds, you'll see the RGB LED turn a beautiful shade of purple, transporting your LoRaWAN packet up to the ThingStack v3 network server. Those bits and bytes, however, are not so interesting as they're just bogus sensor data. So I'm going to walk you through integrating real accelerometer sensor data from our LIS 2DH12 3-axis accelerometer, including adding I2C driver API calls, setting up some variables and structure type defs, creating a periodic timer, creating functions for initializing and reading our accelerometer, and finally, modifying the sendTX data function to incorporate our data. Then we'll take a peek at the live ThingStack v3 data stream, as well as setting up a webhook to the My Devices application server to visualize our data. To get started, let's navigate to the Includes folder tree to the Drivers, WL, HAL Driver, Inc. folder, and open the WL HAL.h file. From there on the right, you can double click on the HAL underscore conf.h file. And here, we'll want to uncomment the HAL I2C module enabled pound define. Next, right click on one of the .c files under the drivers WL HAL driver folder and go to show in system explorer. This will open the actual folder for those .c files and we want to add the i2c.c and i2c underscore ex.c files. So highlight them and drag them into this folder. Link to files. Now our project has access to those I2C functions, so let's use them. Let's go to the application, user, LoRaWAN, Laura underscore app.c file, and add some code. Up at line 70 under the private type def area, we'll create a sensor data structure type def called my sensor underscore t. Next, down at line 127, under the private function prototype section, we'll create three function prototypes for our initialization function, our accelerometer read function, and our timer task. Then down in the variable section, we'll create a structure instance for our I2C bus called HI2C1, a timer object, and a data structure instance from our my sensor type def called my sensor data. Under the LoRaWAN init function near the bottom, We'll call our LIS2DH12init function to initialize our accelerometer. Create a timer with our Excel read timer variable. And it is a periodic timer, so it will restart automatically. Every time it triggers, it will call a function called onExcelReadEvent, which we've defined. And we'll, we'll set up a 100 millisecond periodic timer. And then we'll start the timer. Under the private functions, we'll create our LIS2DH12 init function. And so this code will be available through a repository for the seminar. So you won't have to type all this in. 
but here's the function. We set up our clocks, set up our GPIO pins. We also have to enable the power switch, which is on PB12 to uh, enable power to the accelerometer and uh, set that pin high. We'll initialize the I2C, set up the registers, do a couple of writes to enable the accelerometer, all three axes. We'll also turn the temp sensor on, but uh, for this example we won't use it. Um, the block data update bit, all of these uh, registers can be referenced from the, the data sheet for the accelerometer. And then we'll create an Excel read function, which just goes in and reads the three 16-bit signed uh, values in six, six bytes, and then fill our structure with those values. So this will be called every time we trigger on this timer task on Excel read event, it will call the Excel read function. So the next thing is to send our data up to our network server, and that's done in the sendTXData function. And we're going to comment out these six buffer values and replace them with these eight values here. So this first byte, first two bytes are formatting bytes, so our application server recognizes them as a Cayenne LPP data. We have an ID number, which is a somewhat random number. And then the 71 hex identifies it as an accelerometer type, followed by six data bytes, most significant and least significant bytes, X, Y, and Z. We'll also comment these four bytes out. So our total packet size will be just 8 bytes, well within the 11 byte limit for SF10 communications on the US 915 LoRaWAN band. Save all and rebuild your project. Launch your debugger and that's it. Now if we take a look at our live data stream on the ThingStack console, we can see our join, join request from our end node, join accept from the network server, and then our uplink data packet here, 0071 identifying our accelerometer, and then X, Y, and Z 16-bit sign data. Forwarding our data to the My Devices application server or another third party integration is an easy task. Select your end device, go to Integrations, Webhooks, Add Webhook, choose Cayenne, give your Webhook ID a name, and create Cayenne Webhook. At cayenne.mydevices.com, we can add a new device under LoRa. Things Network. Choose Cayenne LPP. Put your device EUI in and add a device. That's all there is to it. Once those match up, you should start seeing the widgets populate and you should see your accelerometer data changing every 10 seconds or so. Well, a little bit rushed and perhaps best done live in a work hands-on workshop setting, I hope I was able to provide you with the tools needed to get started with the STM32 Cube tools, the STM32WL dual core LoRa enabled microcontroller, and the Dynamite new generic node sensor edition board and get those creative IoT juices flowing. Enjoy!